start by reading to you the climactic ending of the story from Genesis 24 that Drew got started for us. I hope you will read the entire chapter of Genesis 24 during what I assume is your weekly Sunday afternoon scripture reading time. But that compelling story ends with Rebecca being whisked away by Abraham's servant to take her on this very long journey to meet Abraham's son, Isaac, whom she is going to marry. The end of the chapter reads in this way. Then Rebecca and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer the Highroy and settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there is something really old school cinematic about this climactic ending of the 24th chapter of Genesis. You can almost watch it on the big screen. A caravan of camels wanders across the desert. In the distance, a dreamy looking single figure walks alone. He looks up, locks bouncing in the dry air, and sees the caravan in the distance. After a long journey, the camel-mounted maiden looks up, and she sees the mysterious lone figure walking, and she slips off of her creature and asks the servant, who is this man over there walking in the field to meet us? And upon finding that it is the man that she is destined to marry, the maiden tucks up her veil and meets the mysterious figure in the setting sun. Screen goes black, the credits roll, and you take in that breath you've been holding. So something that you'll learn about me is that I am not a romantic. So this ending is like a little too perfect for me. It's a little too Disney princess for me. Um, the dreamy hunk is, of course, Abraham's son Isaac, and the young maiden is his wife to be Rebecca. But hidden in these sacred lines, a couple of details have really clung to me from this story. The first detail is what Isaac has been up to when we meet his wandering visage. When Rebecca sees this dreamy figure walking toward her, the story says, Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahiro. Has anybody ever been to the Beer Lahai Wine? Beautiful spot. Great nightlife, good for couples. Totally kidding. I have also never heard of Beer Lahai Wine. No one actually really knows where it is. Um, what we do know about Beer Lahai Wine is that it is a place with a spring. Water comes up out of the ground at Beer Lahai Wine. And there's this other story in the Bible that takes place in that location. And to know that story, we have to actually go back a generation. So we need to remember a story about Isaac's mother, Sarah. So who has heard of this lady in the Bible named like Hagar? Anybody heard of Hagar? Okay, it's good, it's good. So the story of Hagar and Isaac's mother, Sarah, is basically the story of the beginnings of Judaism and Islam. It's kind of a big deal, and I'm going to pay attention to this piece. Isaac's mom, Sarah, was 
Abraham's wife. And Sarah had this Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. Now Sarah wasn't able to have kids, which was awful because she really wanted a kid. And so she made this hard decision, as many of us do, I'm just kidding, she never do this. But she made this decision to give her slave girl, Hagar, to Abraham as a second wife. So that Hagar could give birth to a son for Sarah and Abraham. This is basically the Handmaid's Tale, minus the Scrabble Games and the Canadian refugee, refugee status. It's the Handmaid's Tale. You watch that. So Hagar, the slave girl, she's forced to marry old man Abraham, and she gets pregnant, you know, fulfilling her purpose as a slave girl wife. But her pregnancy causes a tension between Hagar and Sarah. There are emotions on both sides, as you might imagine. And Abraham's attitude is basically like, well, Sarah, she's your slave, so do whatever you want with her. So obviously, you know, slavery trumps any benefit of marriage that Hagar might have hoped for in this situation. And as a result of this advice from Abraham, such helpful advice, um, the text says that Sarah dealt harshly with her and Hagar ran away. Which if you're familiar with the way that slave masters often treat slaves, uh, Sarah dealt harshly with her, probably as a euphemism for something very, very ugly. So this abused slave girl, Hagar, who is pregnant, runs away from Sarah. And she runs to a place where there is a spring of water. And there in that place, God appears to her and tells her, that it is going to be okay. That she's going to have a son. His name will be Ishmael. And he's going to have lots of descendants. It's going to be okay for her. And it is after this miraculous meeting with God that this pregnant slave girl who has been abused, she names that place with the spring of water, Beer Lahai. So this line, you know, now Isaac had come from Beer Lahaira, is not one of those random Bible lines that uh, you can just skip over until you get to the war and marriage stuff. No, it's actually like quite deep, right? This one line. The text that follows says, he went out in the evening to walk in the field. Now here, the Hebrew word behind walk is actually a little difficult to translate, and some would say its meaning is more related to meditation. So we can imagine Isaac meditating out in this field as he comes back from Beer the Highway. So here's Isaac out in the field in this rom-com, hunky guy scene, walking toward Rebecca's caravan in deep meditation, coming back from the place to which his to which his slave stepmother, pregnant with his half-brother, ran while escaping the abuse of his mother. So that is a detail that caught my attention. And then after this, you know, romantic meeting of Isaac and Rebecca, and kind of yada yada yada, them getting engaged, them planning a wedding, and hiring a florist, and buying little bubble containers, all of that. Then comes a second detail that is so compelling to me. It's the last verse of the story. It says, Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, she became his wife, and he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. At first glance, I kind of find this a little weird. It's a little uh, wife replacing mother, woman doing the emotional work for a man kind of thing. It's a little weird. But I also have not been able to get away from this verse because it is about grief. It's so real and visceral. You just feel this son grieving for his mom, needing someone in his life to come 
comfort him. And you can just see him stumbling back into his mother's empty tent, where she lived and laughed and suffered, where her clothes are still hanging in the closet, where her comb still sits on the dresser and her soap still makes the bathroom smell like the good days. I haven't been able to get away from this verse because I can't seem to get away ever from grief. This last June marked the, the fifth anniversary of my father's death. Many of you probably know how those anniversaries and birthdays and just random, random days can sneak up on you. You probably have felt some of that grief before. You may be feeling it right now. We have loved and we have lost in the last year, in the last decade, in our lifetimes long ago. Whenever it happened, our losses are a part of us. And they take a lot of work and a lot of energy and space, and they should. You know, it, it's an awful lot to process when someone is here and then they're no longer here. That grief work, it takes a lifetime. So here in the sacred story, Isaac is just beginning that grief work for his mom. Her grave is very fresh. And in such a long moment of grief, Isaac brings Rebecca, who is almost a stranger to him. He brings her into his recently deceased mother's tent. When I was training to do pastoral care for people in hospitals, a program that Shirley's husband started, I remember they told us, when you go into someone's hospital room, look around. What is in that room? Are there fresh flowers from loved ones? Are there photos of stuffed animals? Or has that person been there for a very long time? You can learn a lot by looking around in someone's room. You can learn a lot by looking around someone's tent. I wonder what Rebecca saw when she was invited into Sarah's tent. You know, were there fresh flowers or photos or stuffed animals? And I wonder what Isaac noticed as he stepped into the tent. A lot of grief work, as I've experienced it, is about walking around my loved one's tent. Walking around their life, picking up and examining their experiences, opening the cabinets and the tightly shut drawers in my relationship with them, and revisiting their tent over and over again, trying to make sense of it, trying to memorialize it. When I'm doing that grief work for my father, I re-enter his tent. You know, I pick up his wallet and I find that photo of me at 10 years old, all creased and well-worn. And I can let the tears come, knowing how much he loved me and he thought of me. And then on a different day, as I wander around his tent, I notice the, the old black and white framed portraits that used to hang up in our living room. And they were portraits of these young Chinese military officers with whom my father served during the Chinese Civil War. And as I grow older and I meet other Asian Americans with parents that lived through those times of war, part of my grief, grief work has been to, to touch those frames again and to complexify his memory, to know him not only as an angry and a paranoid father, but as a, a traumatized veteran and a man who lived through an oppressive government. Sometimes we find beautiful things in the tent, like, like family photos, and sometimes we find hard things, like tokens of war. And our grief work is to try to make sense of all the things. So I, I wonder if 
Isaac was doing that hard grief work when he met Rebecca. I wonder that because Rebecca first found him meditating in a field after visiting near the highway. I wonder if Isaac, as he wandered around his mother's tent, looked in that shoebox in the closet and found that old photo of Hagar and the son that she gave birth to, Ishmael, torn up into pieces. Maybe he recalled those bittersweet memories of playing with young Ishmael, happy memories that were interrupted by his mother's wrath that eventually sent Hagar and Ishmael away forever. Maybe he wondered what it was like for his slave stepmother and his half-brother and what they think of him now and what the future will be for the children of Abraham, the Jewish children of Isaac, and the Muslim children. I wonder if Isaac walked into the tent with Rebecca and opened that kitchen drawer and pulled out Sarah's old kitchen knife and wept because that was the blade that his father had in his bag when he took Isaac hiking up that mountain. And it was the blade Abraham raised to slit Isaac's throat because he thought God wanted him to sacrifice his only child. Do you remember that story? And the angel came and said, you know, actually, breaking news, God doesn't want you to kill your own child. And they all lived happily ever after. Except that Isaac had to like, live with that trauma his entire life. And the Jewish Midrash, Midrash says that when Sarah found out what had happened, she just couldn't live in a world anymore where her precious child could be murdered by his own father. And that is what led to her death. I wonder if Isaac wept in the kitchen holding that knife in her tent. You know, it's those complicated objects in our loved one's tents, that difficult stuff, that violent, angry, tragedy, suffering stuff, that can take a lifetime of tent visiting to understand and to make sense of. Sometimes we never make sense of it. I want to take a final moment with Rebecca. Because we are so often in the presence of people who have freshly lost loans and who are walking bewildered into those empty tents for the very so it is a live question for, I think, just about all of us. Just what do you do when you are watching someone grieve? When you're first approaching someone who is wandering around in the blur of a distant wilderness, trying to process those first pangs of memories. In those moments, I like to think of the courage and the love it took Rebecca, to take someone's hand, maybe even a stranger's hand, and to be led into the tent of their beloved, to simply hold them steady as they step from her favorite chair to his most worn out book, to sit with them on the old couch and touch a shoulder while they saw him, or to let them tell you a story about that little trinket on the shelf. And to do that the first day, and the next week, and on the anniversary, and on the 10th anniversary, and on the random, random day that bring a few wet tears for no apparent reason. First in Summerfield, we are the spiritual descendants of Rebecca. Do not forget that many of the strangers and the friends that you meet today have an empty tent for a few that they visit every once in a while. A grief or a loss or an absence. Some of those tents hold great trauma, great pain. So let that understanding be a vehicle for our compassion and our love for each soul that we